the official stripes of going against the grain. Welcome back to the Drum Rundown. Standing here in Nashville, Tennessee with Jake Cochran of Illiterate Light. Thanks for having us, man. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming out of the studio. So, obvious first thing is we're standing here with Jake <laughs> from Illiterate Light, which is th something that I don't ever get to say. Talk to me about the unique nature of this standing kit. Yeah, so uh, I play, um, it's, a, it's a standard drum set, all the same pieces that I would be playing sitting down. Um, but I've got some different stands and things. I've raised it up so that I can still play kick pedal, floor tom, snare drum, some cymbals. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm in a duo. My bandmate is a guitarist, and he actually also has a, a Moog Taurus synthesizer, which is basically a, like an organ foot pedal that he's playing bass with his feet. So he's playing bass down there, playing guitar, singing right up on the front of the stage. And uh, it felt a little weird for me when we were kind of figuring that out to be like sitting down, sitting in the back. We, we had a couple of gigs really early on where um, a, a, a sound engineer whose focus was just on uh, getting the job done was like, no, you're not moving your drum set up front. No, you're sitting in the back, yeah. you're, you know. And there's, there was this, this weird dynamic between like, oh, I'm singing harmonies and I'm like half of the show, but my bandmates way out there. Yeah. And, and so... We just kind of like started trying things uh, until one day I was like, well, if I stand up, we'll kind of match. I can be right on the edge of stage with him. And uh, we tried it once and it was awesome. Um, but it has pretty much, it has changed my playing style a lot. I, like uh, it, in really subtle ways, but um, uh, yeah, I'm, you know, playing kick standing up, which is a little weird. Yeah. And it's a little harder to sit back on a groove sometimes, yeah. but I, I I've practiced that a good bit, and then, um, yeah, just it's it, it opens my hands up a lot. I'm a right-handed player, um, and since I can't use my left foot on the hi hat doing a lot of that stuff, I've moved my hi hat over to the right here, which, funnily enough, just changes what I choose to do with my left hand. And um, yeah, it's like just subtle subtle groove choices. Yeah, I was gonna say in terms of kind of setup, it was like a visual or like kind of an energy choice to kind of get up into the front with your bandmate. Right. But it did completely change like the layout of the drums. So yeah. in terms of like the writing process yeah. and kind of creativity, it changed everything. My band mate and I, were, particularly at the beginning, were very live focused. Like whatever we did, we wanted it to work on the spot in front of people. We, we kind of were from a small town in Virginia and played a lot of basement house shows and just really tight, energetic kind of punk spots. Um, so w w like if it couldn't work there, we didn't want to try it on a big stage. You know, it's like, it's, yeah. it's gotta, it's gotta knock the people out. Um, and so that's kind of where this, that, that form of writing and playing came from. And the first record that we put out and the record we're about to put out were all written and recorded with this exact setup in mind. Um, to the point where, like, if I sit down and try to play some of the songs on those first two records, it doesn't work or it doesn't feel right because I make different decisions and and uh, I, I end up doing too much or or um, so yeah, it really changes kind of my playing style and, and and the decisions I make there. The live aspect of it, yeah, it's it's we've just kind of followed that into the studio. And I think like we'll, we'll, we're opening up at this point, working on record three at this point. I'm trying some different drum setups, but um, it's kind of like we found something special and we wanted to grab onto that and let it lead us for a little while. We, the, the, the limitations of it felt really important to us. Yeah, I think limitations can kind of almost help creativity sometimes. Oh, yeah. If you, it's kind of like, well, I have to work with this you know, setup, then it's kind of like you're writing certain grooves. You were talking about ergonomically, you can't sit back uh, on the bass pedal as mm -hmm. much. Your hi-hat is not on the left side. Mm -hmm. You obviously don't have a clutch for that. So it's what, locked closed? It's actually, this was one of the big moments for me when I discovered there's a, uh, DW makes this, it's like a ratchet 
clutch. Um, and so I can go from open, kind of sloshy, uh, to really anywhere in between, and then also crank it really tight. Oh, yeah. Because that was my, like, with a regular drop clutch, I, I hated the, like, like half-closed mm -hmm. kind of smushiness of it. I, when I'm playing, typically sitting, I like to have that hi-hat real tight and real closed. And So having that ratchet means in the middle of a song I can go from tight groove to more of like an open rock sort of thing. And that, that piece of gear, in my mind, was one of the things when I was trying, like, creating this thing that I'm playing, I found that and I was like, I can make this work. Yeah, because that <laughs> does like solve the problem yes, of having yes. the hi hat in the most non traditional location <laughs> I've ever seen, which is super cool though, because it's just like it's a really visual, stunning thing. Let's talk about the thing that kind of is the basis of everything the kick drum. What do you got going down there? Right now I've got a 20 inch, it's a Rogers kick. Uh, I think it's late 60s. It, uh, I bought a, pretty much all of these pieces have come from some sort of vintage shop or drum like kind of like pawn shop kind of thing um this was a, a great record store actually in harrisonburg virginia uh that sells gear called wonder records it's half of the stuff in my studios come from there because it's just i don't know it's it's one of those gems of a place where every time i walk in there's something yep. unique and, and cool um but yeah the, there's it's an incredible kick drum i i stick to 20 um a lot I like the sound live and in a studio it's just a little tighter than the 22 and it and it but it, it's enough of the low end that you can really make it punch and make it um, sound pretty big but the the thing that makes it s specific for my setup is actually that this floor tom is hanging above my kick drum so if it starts getting too big uh, that becomes a real problem yeah. and then those heads start talking to each other and if I'm you know if I'm loud down there then this is uh, you know, yeah, reverberating and, sympathetic buzz yeah. and stuff like that. So yeah, so the 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 setup kind of does inform the twenty inch. Right, right. It started. I started with an eighteen inch kick actually, okay. uh, like a Gretsch Catalina Club. It was my first drum kit, and um, I yeah, it was like an eighteen inch with a fourteen inch tom, just like coming right out of the middle there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like I just used whatever I had to tr to try to stand up. Um, and uh, th there's actually the 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 two drummers that I saw do anything like this that I I was inspired by were are, are actually Meryl Garbus from Tune Yards. Okay, um, and she plays uh, live. She plays like a percussion setup where she's she's really like the lead voice, the lead writer. Um, but then yeah, there was something so beautiful and so cool about how rhythmic she could be on this percussion set while she's performing. She was loop live looping a lot of drum stuff and. I don't know, it just like expanded my brain. And I was just like, if I'm gonna take whatever that is and turn, you know, do yeah. it my way. Um, and then this other, um, this other artist uh, in the band called Givers, they're, they're a smaller band from Lafayette, Louisiana, um, that I saw years back when I was in college. And um, one of their front people, Tiffany, had a similar, she, she was playing percussion, they had a drummer in the back, and then she had this percussion set up up front. And, just the yeah, the 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 polyrhythms between them and her energy up front it was just like i got that i'm so drawn to that thing That's you know cool. yeah yeah and there's not a lot of roadmaps for like how yeah. to do this it's a lot of kind of just iteration and kind of figuring it out yeah. so it's cool to hear your process of like starting and just like figuring out how to get everything up to feeling good yeah uh, i'm i'm constantly changing levels try, like i want it to be high enough that i have yeah. good posture i was also on drumline in high school and that was where okay. I, that's where i got a lot of my stick technique training and, and, and chops. But, um, but yeah, it's like the finding the, the proper heights for some of this stuff where I I'm high enough that it feels good. But then there's, there's also something about having it low and kind of smashing it and being wild with it. Yeah. So, so you can kind of dig into it yeah. while, while standing and dancing the whole time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what head is on the kick drum? Um, so I've got, uh, the power stroke three yep. from Remo. That's just, my go-to on pretty much any kick. Same. Um, it does the job really well, and I, I, I tend towards coated heads on everything. Um, and yeah, I've, I've got a Power Three, uh, Power Strike Three on my snare right now as well, which I kind of um, switch between that and an Ambassador um, or, or an Emperor. Really, like any of those three, depending on the snare and yeah. kind of 
what guitar center I'm at on tour. It's like <laughs> when something breaks, I go buy a new head. Yeah. Um, so th yeah, those are kind of my go-tos on that. And then floor time, I, I, I stick with an emperor. Um, and basically tuning wise on my kick and my tom, I, I don't, I don't get too precious with my, my tuning on my kick. It's just enough that there's a punch and a thud. Um, especially live, but, uh, I have a sound engineer that I work with that has, uh, been with us on the road for probably four years now. And he's, him and I have so many weird little things that we've tried and dialed in. And, um, he basically just, uh, yeah, helps me figure out the, the how, how loose can I have it and still have the, the punch in the yeah. body. But, but I do kind of like a little bit more of the flappiness of, of a, of a, a looser kick head. Um, and then my floor tom, I actually tune also about as low as it can go. So pretty much just finger tightened and then finished with a, a drum key, just like an mm -hmm. eighth, eighth turn beyond that. Um, and I, I, do, I, I have some beats where I try to get these sounding pretty similar live okay. so that I can, it almost is double kick if I, like, um, in like a way where if you're watching the show, and you see me do it, you're just like, what, what's, where's that coming from? Sounds like, like doubles. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Uh, it's very much of like, I like to play with the, having as few options as possible and forcing myself to uh, play like a normal drummer. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Uh, like you were talking about limitations to kind of get a full kit sound in such a unique setup. Why don't you give us a little demonstration of that kind of double? Can do. Yeah, totally. So that sort of thing. That sounds awesome. Yeah, that's very cool. Uh, what is the dimension on that floor tom? Yeah, this floor tom is super weird. I think it is actually um, an old, uh, like marching field drum, like okay. an old Ludwig marching field drum. I bought it at this shop in Nashville here called Nelson yeah. Nelson's Drum Shop. Um, the best, the coolest. It would, I, every time I'd been in there for two years, it had just been sitting up on this shelf, and it didn't have a bottom head, like anything. And I was just like, how much for that thing when, one day? And they were, it was a hundred bucks or something. But it's, it's like also from the sixties, 15 inch uh, head by 12 inches deep. Okay. So that when that, like, when I saw that it was perfect for me. Cause I, before that I had had a 16 by 16, which just gave me like just a few centimeters of clearance over the kick head. And it was just too close. Um, so this was uh, just a little tighter in, and um, and then the the shorter depth made a lot yeah. of sense for my setup. And this is actually like the one drum that every time I play it live, uh, somebody comes and it's like, "What's going on with that tom?" Yeah. Just because it's uh, it's so low, it's so low and chunky. And uh, yeah, it's it's I love this thing. Um, the other thing is that I've I find really interesting is every sit down drum kit I've ever played. Um, the floor tom is on legs and, yeah. uh, you know, it's, that usually ties it into the ground a little bit. Um, the fact that I have to suspend this, like it's a rack tom, it, it, it gives it a, a I don't know, more resonant or more yeah, like, sure. like, uh, decay to it or something yeah. like that. Um, to the point where I've like a few times had to play it, play this in a more traditional sitting setting and I put legs on it and it's just like it's not doing the same it thing. Does, yeah, 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 yeah. So, I don't know. It, it was a fascinating, it's like, so it would be a little, it's a little funky to have a floor tom suspended, but um, yeah, it, it works. It's definitely moving air and it sounds so similar to the bass drum. That is a really effective mm -hmm. uh, demonstration you just gave us. What is it on uh, mounting wise? Yeah, so these are all just like, these are all just stands that I have found over time and put together to make what I want happen. So I'm sure there's a better way to do this, but this is probably, this is probably like an old like Pearl or PDP base with a Mapex arm, Tom arm going into some, some nameless <laughs> yeah. rat 15 inch. It was yeah. just like, I just wandered around 
until you music shops thing. until I was like that and yeah. that and that and it's the right height and a lot of the other stands I have are DW I think 5000 series okay. yeah. um, and yeah it's j just stuff that's robust and, and strong enough that I can take it and beat it up on the road and push a cymbal and it's not going to fall over and um, but then the other half it's just yeah, literally whatever I could find. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I love that because that's so much of my own personal ethos yeah. is like making my own thing work, which is very, very cool. Uh, as far as uh, resonant heads, what do we got on all of these guys? Yep, so um, Ambassador resonant on the snare, uh, I believe an Emperor um, on the Tom, and then an Ambassador uh, Weather King. It's more of like, a, I think it's one of the vintage um, resonant heads on the kick. Cool. Very cool. And then in terms of uh, kick pedal, I see an Iron Cobra, but I know that's not what you normally Yeah, I, so I, I was, uh, this is kind of my backup. I also typically am touring with a DW5000. Um, just the, both of them are, are, they feel kind of like workhorse. Yeah. It, I'm, I do a lot down there, uh, but it, I, I don't know. It's what I've always played. And every time I try to move to something nicer, um, I just kind of miss the thing I know. So, yeah. Um, I'm pretty simple when it comes to that. And in terms of feel, ergonomics, or any like holding tension in your body when you play, is there anything that you're doing to kind of avoid? I, my first thing in my mind is like, dude's got to have shin splints <laughs> standing. It's uh, funny because you, you are a heavy hitter. I mean, you have a heavy yeah. foot, and but you're not kind of sitting over top and kind of leaning into it like I think all the traditional drummers are at home. It's like, how's this dude heavy hitting standing up? <laughs> so it's a funny, it's a funny mixture. Uh, one thing that I do is. Uh, yeah, my, my center of balance is typically on my left uh, foot and leg, and I, and I have actually pretty good balance with this leg to the point where I, I, I do try to get this sitting back feeling a lot of times. If, like, when I watch videos of myself play, depending on the beat, some, sometimes I'm like leaning forward into it and I'm way up on my toe and I'm, and I'm like driving heavy in and like I see my back kind of yeah. crumpled over and I'm like that's gonna hurt yeah. <laughs> and then there's other there's other, like we have a song where um I had the audacity to do like a, a purdy shuffle type beat and I uh <laughs> it became the song that we play every day uh every gig and it's great and I, I love the beat but it's a very funny thing to do standing up and um but yeah, when I when I play that, I like I really almost sit on an imaginary stool or something so yeah. that I can feel that pull back and I, I have a little bit more touch with my foot that way. Um, but yeah, it's it's really just like the interplay of, of my my balance between am I am I splitting weight between these two and and doing like heel down, yeah, or am I sitting back a little? Right um, on. So it's. Uh, the funny thing is with, with this setup, but after doing it for about six years and having this configuration, um, every time I tour, whether I'm opening or, or headlining, it, it, when there's other drummers around and this thing is setting up, it everybody that's come like, oh, like what's this all about? And like, yeah. and then they try it, it's very intuitive. Um, and it's, you know, maybe the heights are different because yeah. it's like, if you're taller or shorter or something, it can be awkward. But um, pretty much anybody that I've been like, yeah, go, go play around a little bit it sounds just like yeah <laughs> it's not I mean, it's not all the callers are here they're yeah. just kind of set up in a different when i talk about playing as a stand-up drummer a lot of times people think like oh he's playing like a cocktail kit or right. it's like a it's more jazzy or or it's it's um like a lot of rockabilly mm -hmm. folks play play yeah. that way and and that's just not really my origin um so i don't really play like that and and uh, I've actually never played one of the cocktail kits where it's like the, the tom that mm -hmm. is really tall and they look cool, but um, I feel like the way that I play, I would break that thing way quicker than I would break this thing. <laughs> so yeah, it's more about um, yeah. I don't know. I come. I grew up more with like John Bonham and Ringo and mm -hmm. and and that sort of thing. Like, how do I do that? but stand up stand up and i think that's what's so interesting and why i wanted to talk to you yeah because it is not what you think a standing kit is going to sound like especially on the records and in live it sounds like this big rock kit nice. and it's not missing anything um so that's very awesome yeah congratulations on pulling <laughs> off such a unique thing let's jump into symbols cool. um i see some familiar friends what do we got yeah so um uh, I'm playing Peisty 2002 hi hat. This is this is kind of my my go-to for tour, um, 
and like I was showing, yeah, this ratchet clamp like allows me to open so and cool. close. <laughs> um, that thing, I love that thing. Um, I gotta get one of those. But the, um, yeah, the 2002s, especially live, I just, for, for hi-hats, I'm, I'm cranking them tight most of the time and I just want something that cuts. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I don't know, it's just a really classic sound that I love. Um, ride right now, or it's kind of like Crash Ride. I, I'm trying out a bunch of new stuff. Uh, for years, I, I fell in love and have been, been playing this, this Peisty um, Masters Dark Crash Ride. And as you can see, it's it's broken in so many ways that I keep finding ways to like break chunks. Uh, let's see this. Can you break it like? Oh, oh, it's I, I love the sound of this thing to the point. <laughs> there we go. Uh, I now just play it on recordings because yeah. it's still it's like it's one of those things. Uh, I love things the longer I have them. Like yeah. I I can get excited about a new piece of gear, but if I like this snare drum I've had my grandfather gave to me when I was like four or five years old just thinking like oh maybe he'll be into music one day or something and I have these pictures of me playing it like barely being able to reach the top and then like I found it in my closet like eight years ago and I was like what's this and it's this, it's like a beautiful old Ludwig Superphonic and and I was like I have this like what is yeah. that so I have this this awesome connection to that I there's another thing I don't really tour with I, I just use it in the studio um but yeah between that and between like uh, th this symbol was actually given to me by my buddy Steve Gorman, who was the longtime drummer of the Black Crows, and he he saw me play here in Nashville one time, and uh, whatever symbol I was playing, he came up to me afterwards. He was like, "We got to get rid of that garbage can that you got," <laughs> <laughs> and so he gave me this, which was just like mind blowing. You know, this is an in incredible symbol, yeah, um, and a really unique sound. And and um, so I, I'm I like at this point, th this is kind of my one of my go-to symbols in the studio. Live, um, I'm looking for something with a little bit more of a bell sound than this. This is a super complex. Let's see what it sounds like now that I yeah I've, we've got a custom new sound. First, uh, this exclusive drum run down exclusive. <laughs> Yeah, so it sounds better than it did a second ago. I'll tell yeah, you, I mean, just that little piece going. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's just dark and trashy at this yeah. particularly trashy at this point. Um, but it, the thing for me when I started playing this cymbal, coming from a, a thicker ride, um, it allowed me to play with a lot more touch because I could get this sort of wash that I wanted yeah. without really having to like cross stick or slam the side. I was like getting, uh, I'm, I'm playing the drums really hard and then I'm able to just like go much lighter on the mm -hmm. cymbals, which in a recording setting is, is a game changer. Live, uh, I'm, I'm now angling back more towards something that has right. a little more cut to it. Um, so yeah, I'm trying out a few things right now. This is a, a Peisty, um, let's see, Signature Thin, and I think it's a 20 inch. Yeah. So that's, it's similar in its complexity and has a, has a dark, washy sound to it. A little, the bell jumps out a little bit more. Yeah, more so, articulate bell, um, for sure. So yeah, that's kind of, the, that's, that's what I'm, playing with right now um also I've, I've been rotating out this which is a, a dark full ride and it's a 21 it's, it's a, a bit thicker and it's m more of a traditional ride which sounds great too but since i only play with one symbol yeah. i'm kind of like i think it's a little too ride focused and i yeah. want something that's I can crash on, but isn't going to have that deep, low sustain. It goes away a little sooner. So. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say the trail off on that is so long. Yeah. That's your only <laughs> thing. It's You're kind of into take, a dynamic nightmare where that's kind of like into the next phrase. It like starts taking problem. over. Yeah, exactly. It is interesting, uh, the choices that we make uh, in that when you only have one. It's yeah. like it has to do so much. It has to have the bell. It has to have good ride and good crash. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's it's the white whale. I've, we're always I've, looking for it. I've thought, uh, you know, more and more, I'm like, oh, maybe I should put another, like, something over here so this doesn't have to do everything. But so much of what I do live is is about, like, I, I also sing. Mm -hmm. I uh, mainly sing harmonies, but it's like I've got usually a mic right here, and for me, the performance and the connection with the audience is 
is more important than if I have a crash symbol or not. Yeah. So uh, I can get what I want out of this, and I love being forced to like play it a particular way, and then I can still see the, the beautiful people out And front. they can see the beautiful you. <laughs> Uh, speaking of this position over here, what do we have in the SBD? Yeah, so this is this is new for me on the last record. Um, yeah, like I mentioned earlier, my bandmate for the last five years has been playing bass with his feet and doing some low octave stuff on his guitar, but he's basically been covering all the low end. Um, this is is me starting to take some of that okay. on. Um, so one thing that that I I'm really excited about as far as our band goes and the way that we perform is um, we're, we're playing everything live. We're, we're not running any tracks. We're, we're not, we've even tried some, some drum loops that I can then play over top of, but we, we more and more just, just love um, treating like this, this Roland sampler here, treating it like an instrument yep. um, or treating it like the instrument that it is where um, I take, uh, bass samples from the synthesizer that Jeff is using um, and I lay it out per song. This is how it sounds, starting with the lower left and then I have a, kind of a bass line that I play uh, in a counterclockwise okay. manner. Um, and then I've always got my top middle as the mute. Okay. Um, cool. So yeah every yeah, every song every patch that i have is similar like bass note that i start on is and then i also have uh it's not just bass notes sometimes i have like chord samples or um single note like uh a lot of times to start a song it, there's like a pad that'll evolve a little bit while my guitarist is tuning or something mm -hmm. like that um and then So I'm playing that along with yeah. uh, with Jeff over there playing guitar and singing. And then, so that's kind of the, the, the way I'm using this, this Roland. Um, this is the SBD SX, which I love. And they just came out with um, a, a, like the next level up. I think it's the Pro or something yeah. like that. And I've been... I've is that been, the red one? No, the red one was... was it's the same computer as this one. Okay. But there's a, there's a, like... A brand new one, like new the pokey, last couple months. New, new Pokemon. Yep, yeah. <laughs> and uh, just changed some some of the routing stuff. I, I I'm pushing it. I'm doing a lot with this. I have three or four outputs going to different places. Bass. It, I have a mono bass signal to to one track. Um, all my high end samples to another, and then um, I've got this Yamaha Reface. It's a little little uh, FM synthesizer here. Uh, the DX that I I also run into it and then can process with effects live here and then I'm sending that out separately as well. So I've I'm, I'm using this in like every way I can figure out how to use yeah. it and and I absolutely love it. Um, let's see if is this plugged in right here? I always got to remember it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> always throw the snares off. But yeah, these are just ways that um, for the new record, which is, it was written during the pandemic. It was recorded during the pandemic. So uh, a lot of the songs are more studio focused, yeah. uh, have more texture, more evolution throughout. And to bring that live, we didn't want to just turn on a, a track and follow it. We're honestly like, we, we rush like hell when we play live and and it really just depends on the show and and the the you know my guitarist can start something and it'll be 15 bpm faster than yeah. than than the way we wrote it um and it's just what feels right and we really believe in like following that and so um ha having ways that w maybe you know maybe i can't play drums and keys at the same time but there's something to me that's that's more human about like what can these guys do on stage mm -hmm. than i want it to sound like the record or I want it to, I want it to sound as big as possible. So um, that's kind of what this station is for me is like, what can I still do live? Um, and how can I enhance the show with my humanness and with the fact that I'm not a great keys player and I'm going to miss some stuff. And, and uh, yeah, it's like, I don't know, the, the celebration of the fact that everybody's together in the room doing it. 
So you're not playing to tracks. Mm -hmm. Everything is samples on this awesome unit. How in the world is it making it to the crowd? Yeah, so uh, I'm sending it um, both direct to my sound engineer, and, and so he's got the direct signal, but a big part of it for me is also uh, I have an, an amp on stage with me. Right now, it's this old Sun bass amp that is what I have in my studio right now, and, and it's probably a little overpowered for what I'm doing here. Typically, I have a, a Roland jazz chorus, um, and I set it up on its side, and I also use it to climb on, and uh, anything anything that's on set with me is become something that I can climb on or jump off of. Um, but yeah, I really love the in in the in the ethic of treating these things like instruments is like I come from small rock clubs and and house shows, and I want there to be stage pressure. Mm -hmm. And the people that I you know as a listener, I'm up front when I when I really love a band, and I the it's usually the worst sounding place to be up front because you can't hear the vo the vocals they're way past you back here and usually it's just guitar amp and and but there's something really special to me about that about choosing to be up front and getting blasted and so uh, my my guitarist his amps are loud as hell um, I have anything that I'm doing here I want the sound to be connected to it I, I want there to be a visual I hit this and it comes out there because it, it maybe it's just a pet peeve of mine, but when I see drummers playing electronics and I don't know what's happening, it's it's it it's a real like division in my brain, and I'm just like I just want to know like all I hear is the the stick hitting the pad, especially if there's no like other stage volume. Mm -hmm. It's just like yeah, it almost breaks the fourth wall <laughs> yeah, or something. I, yeah, it just for me it, uh, it I have like a violent negative reaction to that. So I really like to have something here um, j really just so that there's that stage pressure and it yeah. feels like right there up in your face. You guys have such an interesting ethos in terms of bringing the audience in to what you do. Mm -hmm. So much so that, you know, the bike stuff, yeah, which yeah. is just mind blowing. <laughs> and I love, I love that. Um, illiterate bike. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Both my bandmate and I love bikes. Um, bicycles, we, you know, I'm a little scared of motorcycles personally, but we love bicycles and um, when my bandmate Jeff and I met in the first band we were in years ago, a lot of it was actually surrounding a, a bicycle tour that we would do with some friends where we would throw as much gear as we could on little, on like kitty trailers on our bikes and, and bike around Virginia for two weeks um, playing shows strictly you know city to city with sometimes 15 to 20 people biking in in support of the the bands and just the experience of it all um and then out of that we also were just like well what else can we do with bikes um we decided that we wanted to build a bicycle power generator we had heard some some folks on the west coast doing that um and it was a super inspiring project so our buddy nicolas kind of like drew up schematics and got that going and we helped finish it out and then we, we started powering these shows with a tandem bike hooked up to a single bike generator um, and that would power one PA speaker basically and at that stage it was so DIY that like the bike on the generator made more sound than, than the speaker could produce. <laughs> so we're playing like acoustic guitar and singing and it's basically a noise project at that point because it's like <laughs> and uh, but the, the it was such a special and electrifying moment for for to, to like have two people from the crowd jump up and everybody is doing it together and we're not plugged into any walls i don't know there, there's a it was kind of a life-changing moment for me and my relationship to power and and like yeah the environment and how how am i getting wh where is this power coming from it's it's all just a wall and i never think about it until i'm the one on the bike and i have to feel how hard it is to put that sound out because we weren't running a battery, so it was just direct. So if the sound gets louder, you pedal harder, and you feel you feel the resistance change, and you're just like, oh crap, I gotta go. Um, so my bandmate Jeff and I loved that, and in the last two years, we've had the uh, joy and honor of, of finding a company out in Oakland, California, that builds those professionally called Rock the Bike. We bought one of their systems. Now we have up to six bikes that we bring to certain shows and festivals where we have six bikes powering, uh, you know, a small PA with two tops and a sub usually. Um, 
and and then we've started incorporating some solar panels and battery banks to like it, it's all just like stuff you buy at a camping store to just like <laughs> how do I how do we make this work? It's kind of the same thing as my drum set. It's like I don't really. Uh, there's definitely somebody doing this in a more professional way, <laughs> and and that's that's not gonna hold me back. I'm just going to figure out how to do it in a way that I can use whatever's around me to make happen. Um, so yeah, and then the the kind of the culmination of that is last year we ran a, a, a stage for three days at the Newport Folk Festival, yeah. um, which was just an incredible experience. We we helped curate it. We brought some artists in. We we had artists from other parts of the festival do like little pop up shows. Um, but yeah, we had six bikes running and and for three days straight, it was it was pretty incredible. That's super awesome. Let's talk about this snare. What do you got? Yeah, so this is an incredible old um, Ludwig Superphonic. It's I guess the I think it's the five inch. Um, and yeah, my my grandfather had given this to me when I was. I don't know, probably four or five, and uh, I didn't know anything about it, clearly. I, I wasn't a drummer at that point. It, it just got stuck into a, a closet somewhere at my, my parents' house, and then probably about eight years ago, I pulled it out of a closet, now a drummer, and and drooling over buying vintage snares on, yeah. on eBay or something, and I find this thing in my closet, and I'm just like, this is incredible, um, and it's really meaningful to me because my grandfather gave it to me and, and it's almost like he knew, you know, it was yeah. like way back in the day, he was like, hey, this guy's going to be a drummer. He wasn't a drummer. He just found it at a thrift store or a, a yard sale. He was a yard sale hunter. Um, so yeah, pop found this for me and, and gave it to me. And, uh, I use it in the studio a ton. Um, it's, it's a little finicky live, just the, the way I play it, you know, lugs and tension rods loosen mm. up pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, I love it in the studio. And I, I also, I'm a big fan of the snare weight stuff. Um, probably for the last four or five years, I've had one of these on my snare, both recording and live. I like it so much more than the moon gel. It, 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 as you hit it, it gives a little hop a lot of times. So it, it's almost like it's gating. Yeah. The sound you AB those fours. So, yeah. So without it. Yeah, it just gives it that little extra control. And yeah. I mean, you are getting such cool control too out of the, the power stroke with the, you know, the ring inside. Right. That's just like a little bit more control. Well, that sounds awesome. And what are you cracking it with? Yeah, so I, I've been, I've been playing Vic Firth since high school drumline. It was that was the stick brand our our drumline used, and and then I think that was the only bumper sticker I ever had on my car was a Vic Firth bumper sticker. Um, so I've just always stuck with them, and the Extreme 5A is what's feeling really good to me right now, um, especially live, just the little bit of uh, extra extension uh, I find when I'm just playing a regular 5A or something, I, I'm often like choking back too much to try mm -hmm. to get that slap. Um, and yeah, these just let me do that without, with still having a good, you know, balanced fulcrum point, and um, they've been great. Uh, I, I, for w when I'm in the studio, a lot of times I will uh, play something a little smaller, um, maybe down to uh, a 7A even. Okay. Um, and that's primarily just to like, I can still get what I want out of the drums, but my touch is better on the cymbals yeah. there. Well, we are in your studio after all, so why don't you talk to me a little bit about the workflow in here? Yeah, I, so um, on top of drumming for Literate Light, I drum for a bunch of other people. I do remote drumming sessions and, and I produce full records out of here. Um, not drumming at all, just sitting on the couch and running the Pro Tools session and stuff. Um, but I, I have a, a funny, you know, I, I started recording just in high school and, and like buying the cheapest audio interface and knowing nothing, never took a recording class, just learning by trying. And then once my band kind of got some steam and we started working with cool uh, engineers and producers, uh, Vance Powell was a big one for us. We did some stuff with him on our first record and getting into his studio here in Nashville. He has some uh, cool stuff. It's very cool. He and has I, cool stuff. His, his just like um, kind of the way he treats everything where it's mm -hmm. like uh, it, it, he leans into the weirder stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, it's yeah. like everybody, everybody needs to know how to put up a mic correctly and, and run it into the right preamp and, and this is how you get this sound. And 
I know I'm getting to the point now where I, I get that and I can, if, if you want something specific, I can find it and make it sound that way. But the thing that I'm really good at both with playing and, uh, and listening and producing is, is like do something weird, like get, get mm -hmm. the basics covered for sure. But, um, I always try to find something that's, that's wrong or, or, or something that's broken, a symbol that's broken or an amp that's broken or right now I'm, uh, one of the funny things I'm doing today is I'm running these, this broken set of headphones, uh, okay. the right, the right side is broken, but I've got the, the left ear plugged directly into this old uh, Yamaha PA over there um, oh, wow. that is being sent into Pro Tools over there somewhere. And this is basically just acting as a weird mic. Hey, check, check, check. And uh, it's also, it's, there's a spring reverb unit in there. And I'm just, I'm basically just sitting it on my kick and it's picking up a little bit of the whole kit and it just sounds super screwed up and weird. And it's the kind of thing where like that is just enough to, you know, I'll I'll blend that in to, to taste, um, and if or maybe I'll like there'll be a moment in a recording where everything cuts out and it's just that sound for a couple of seconds. It's just those those weird little moments that that make listening to a recording different than going to see something live because you can really play with it in that way. Um, so I'm, I'm doing that, and then yeah, m some of the more traditional stuff. Um, I really love these ribbon mics from a, a company actually just over in Madison, uh, Stagger Microphones. And right now I'm, I'm running these as, uh, as mid-side, uh, which basically just means rather than a traditional stereo where there'd be a left and a right, since my kit is set up where it would just be really cymbal heavy mm -hmm. on one side and nothing over there and snare would be out of focus because it, it gets confusing. And um, so what I'm doing here is like the middle mic is, is shooting across my kit, getting some cymbals and still focusing on the snare. And then this, this mic here is actually picking up from both sides and I have that routed in a, in a way in Pro Tools where it's phase flipped and it, know, it's kind of recording yeah. stuff. But basically it, it allows me to have a, a wide stereo sound, um, but, but still a focused uh, snare and um, it works well in mono and, and it works well in stereo. So that that's kind of a fun thing that I've got going on right now. But, Super fun. But uh, I, I just, yeah, the, the overheads and the room mics, I've just got mics taped to walls in different places. Um, yeah, okay, I'm just not yeah. seeing, yeah. I'm Loving, like, lovingly gaff taped to a wall. Yeah. Um, just because it's like, why not? It, you know, why use a stand when you can use gaff tape? Um, it's much cheaper. <laughs> there you go. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of, that's some of the weird stuff and some of the fun stuff I've got going on here. Um, and then close mics on everything. I've, I, I use a lot of universal audio, uh, Apollo interfaces and gear. Um, and part of what's super cool about that for me is, um, especially doing remote drum sessions where I just get sent somebody's song and, and some notes of like, this is what I want a drum track to sound like. And I'm working in a studio alone um i i can i have it usually set up where this is a little closer back and then i've got this station over here where um i can check my drums i can change the the preamp levels i can do everything and that's so much nicer than than like running back and forth to the computer or to to, to like a, a board for preamps and stuff so i absolutely love the, the apollo stuff and then i've also started to integrate uh, as i've you know i, I I'm weird about gear. I don't like spending a lot of money on gear, but I do love finding that old weird thing that, mm -hmm. that has some character. So I'm, I'm, I've got like a, an old Tascam uh, mixing board um, that I'm running a bunch of stuff through right now that just sounds more like the 70s than, um, and yeah, yeah, a lot of that I do on the computer afterwards as well and can process. But there is something special about just plugging into an old piece of gear and turning a knob until it sounds mm -hmm. cool. Um, so the yeah the workflow there is is a a mix between using the the newer digital stuff um, for the ease and like really I mean the sound quality is incredible and then having the weirder old stuff that I can layer in for the character um, and really just a uh, like a process yeah. thing than it is sound. like I probably could get a similar sound using the digital preamps and processing after the fact, but I'll make a decision very differently if I'm using a real synthesizer 
plugged into a an old uh, reverb unit, yeah. you know, and it's committed to that. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm not going to then go after go after the fact and clean it up, and it's just going to be like, oh, that's the sound. And, right. Uh, more and more working with engineers on Illiterate Light Records and then bringing that to my home studio, it's, it, it feels good to just commit to something. And then at the end of the day, it's just like, it's already done. <laughs> yeah, I think it sounds like you're really chasing something at the microphone level, right? At, and, and getting the air moving. Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a purity there. And I think there is like this debate happening, which is like, oh, you can't really tell the plug-in versus mm -hmm. the thing. And you can A-B it and like you'd have to be you know, at this level to hear the nuance, but I think that there's something, like you said, in the process uh, of connecting with the instrument and connecting with uh, the workflow and connecting with the crowd. Thanks for having us to your home studio here and checking out your super unique setup and your super unique workflow and kind of giving us a BTS of Sunburn, which is coming out here at the end of the month. Yeah, well, thanks for coming out of here. Of course, and we are here in studio with Jake Cochran of Illiterate Light. This has been Jared James with The Drum Rundown. We'll catch you on the next one. Thanks, Jared.